Well, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in to our summer Bible teaching series for summer 2022 at NBC. We trust that these series will be an encouragement to you in your faith as you walk with Jesus and as you are better equipped to walk with others along their faith journey. We also want to remind you that at NBC, we are a year-round facility and we have a series of opportunities for you to engage in in keeping with our mission of growing resilient, biblically rooted families. So make sure you check out our website at muskokabible.com to get all the information. We'd love to see you up here this fall and winter. Well, good morning. If you would uh, turn to Micah, Micah chapter 3, we will spend our time in, at least the initial part of our time, in Micah 3, and uh, I want to focus on one verse in particular, Micah 3, 8, and uh, that'll take us also into the New Testament. But as uh, you're turning there, just to kind of summarize as to where we've been, we are looking at the Old Testament prophet of Micah, and uh, Micah is part of the Book of the Twelve. Uh, we sometimes describe him as one of the minor prophets. But in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament scrolls, there would have been one scroll for all of the twelve. In other words, Micah is bound together with the other 11 uh, minor prophets that run from Hosea all the way through to Zechariah, sorry, Malachi. And um, <clears throat> that size of that scroll would have then been a similar size to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and therefore was really kind of seen as one book. And we also noted, this is important, that Micah always appears in these Old Testament copies that we have, and even the, what are known as the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is what the Apostle Paul and the other apostles often used, uh, Micah always appears be between Jonah, there's Jonah, Micah, and then Nahum. And those three appear together because they're dealing with a common situation, and that is Assyria. And Jonah deals with God's mercy to Assyria. And we, you know the story, I think, very, very well. And uh, God displays himself in Jonah as a God of mercy and salvation, but also one who threatens judgment if there is not repentance. And then on the other side of Micah is Nahum, and Nahum is primarily a judgment against Assyria. The prophet Nahum, knowing that Assyria would, yes, they did repent for a period of time, but ultimately went back to their wicked, wicked ways, and Nahum then is a prophecy of judgment against Assyria. But lest Israel think, Israel and Judah think, well, you know, that's, what, that's how God deals with the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, but we are his people, and whatever we do, he will never enter into judgment with us. Micah is a prophecy of judgment, as we saw yesterday, against the sins of Israel and Judah. Sins that range from idolatry and lying and violence and the sin of covetousness, all of them breaking the Decalogue. On Friday, we will look at the way in which God is the God also of salvation for Israel. But today we want to look at Micah 3, which is in many respects a series of judgments. You may, you may have caught it on Monday, I mentioned that Micah, we, our Micah consists of seven chapters. The, the chapter divisions of the Bible date from around the 
8th and 9th century BC, AD. Uh, the Bible that our Lord would have read didn't have any chapter divisions, uh, let alone verse divisions. Verse divisions come from the 1550s. It was a French Calvinist, a French Huguenot named uh, Robert Etienne, or as we sometimes call him, Stephanus, who is on a, <laughs> he was on a carriage ride from Lyon. He was escaping persecution in France, going to Geneva or Geneva, and uh, decided to pass the time by versifying the Bible. And some people have jokingly said, you know, he's, he's got a quill pen, and uh, he's in a carriage, probably very few springs, challenging roads, potholes, that every time the carriage hit a pothole and, you know, his pen might have accidentally just made a score and because sometimes the verse divisions don't make any sense at all, right? You're like, well, why did they divide the verse there? Well, we have Stephanus to thank for that. Uh, of course, uh, these verse divisions are very helpful for us, but you need to remember in the, in the, uh, the, the text that our, the early church read, in fact, the, the church all the way down to the ninth century, there are no chapter divisions. And so if we were to divide Micah according to how he delivered the various judgment oracles, there's about 21 in there. And today we're going to look at three in Micah chapter three. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit uh, in some detail. And uh, those of you who may be interested in pursuing this further, there is uh, a book at the back. I've only got a limited number. I wish I'd brought more uh, called The Empire of the Holy Spirit, a number of, of essays that I wrote at, uh, over the number of years on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Very early on, let me give you a little existential background or experiential background. <clears throat> when I was first converted in uh, 1974, hardly it hardly seems so many years have passed, but I became a Christian in the spring of 74. Sometime in February of 74, <clears throat> I was baptized as a believer at Stanley Avenue Baptist Church in uh, April of that year. And, um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure what led me to be involved at, at some point. But although I was going to a Baptist church, I was very interested in the charismatic movement. And in fact, regularly when my wife used to go up to a, a charismatic meeting at a place called Campbellsville, um, in Campbellsville called Bezac. I don't know if anybody, anybody remember Bezac? B-E, yeah, okay, good, good. It was run by a, an evangelical United Church minister, um, that's not an oxymoron, uh, and I'm, I'm being a bit, maybe a bit nasty there, but uh, the collapse of the, of the United Church in our day is, is, a, is a major disaster. Uh, uh, I won't go into that. But uh, Bernie Warren and a <clears throat> an Anglican minister who was the nephew of um, the principal of Wycliffe College. Uh, the Evangelical Anglican School where I was attending studies. His name was Garth Hunt. And it was, it was a charismatic meeting. We'd start Friday night around 7 o'clock, go to about 11. And uh, I would have been involved in that for about probably about four or five years. I do not believe uh, certain things I would have believed then, but it gave me a long-lasting interest in the Holy Spirit. Uh, both in terms of the history of thinking about the Spirit, but also the importance of the Holy Spirit in our Christian lives. And while I would disagree with Charismatics and Pentecostals and, say, Vineyard on certain areas, I think one of the things that they do, uh, they remind us, is of the vital importance of the Spirit. This is going to be the burden today. The vital importance of the Spirit in our lives. And we as evangelicals, or whatever, however you might describe yourself as a, as a Christian, uh, we have tended to knee-jerk reaction against uh, Pentecostalism because of certain extremes or uh, maybe some bad experiences you've had. And we've downplayed the Spirit. 
Now, I know very well that the central role of the Holy Spirit, according to John 16, is to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. That little, that little phrase uh, in the middle of John 16, uh, that he shall glorify me. Uh, four words in English, three words in the original Greek. That is his central new covenant ministry, a ministry that makes much of the Spirit and little of Jesus is not walking in step with the Spirit. But having said that, I fear that sometimes in our churches, we make little of the importance of the Spirit. And we need to pray that as we gather as God's people, the Spirit be in our midst, that He uh, anoint, and again, I know that word can be misused, that He anoint the ministry of the Word. And that the word go home like a sharper, a sharp two-edged sword dividing us under, as it were, thoughts and intents of the heart. So that's what I want to think about this morning. And I want to think about, and to kind of give you an overview before I go, I want to think about the way the Spirit is vital for courage. Uh, I don't think I have to tell you, we live in times of anxiety and times of fear. Uh, to what dis- to extent those, that fear is real, to what extent it's manufactured by the media, uh, whatever the case, I think we live in deeply anxious times. And how can we live in these days? Well, we need the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We need His strength. And particularly, focus today is going to be on the power of the Spirit to be witnesses to Christ. Micah 3. And I said, listen, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, you who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off my people and the flesh off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off them, break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a kettle, like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, that is the leaders, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have acted wickedly. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who put nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without revelation. The sun shall go down upon the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you rulers of Jacob and chiefs of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Its rulers give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets give oracles for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, surely the Lord is with us, no harm shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. These are judgment articles. There are three of them. The first one runs from verses 1 down to verse 4. Notice it begins with that phrase, hear, listen, pay attention. That, that, that little phrase occurs four times in the book of Micah. Three of the times, back in chapter 1, here in chapter 3, verse 1, and in chapter 6, verse 1, it indicates brand new sections, large sections. Here the phrase occurs twice, but it indicates its address now is primarily not to all the peoples, but to the leaders, to the leaders of Israel and to the leaders of Judah. And the writer expects, does he not, that if you are called to be a leader of God's people, you should love the good. You should know the good. Notice he says, listen, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice? 
The word just, the word know there, is the word that is used for Adam knowing Eve. It's not just an intellectual knowledge. The Bible is, of course, interested in uh, giving intellectual knowledge and of the acquisition of intellectual knowledge, but it's deeper than that. Here, the heart is involved. Adam's knowing Eve involved affection. And should you not, you who are leaders in Israel, you who are uh, priests, kings, and those appointed by the kings, prophets, those who are commissioned to teach, should you not love the good? Should you not love justice? What is right? Uh, we don't have time to develop this, but if we did, if we had another hour or two, uh, we don't. Uh, one of the ways in which I would take this would be through uh, uh, the North African or the African theologian Augustine, who in his great book, The City of God, lays out, uh, this is what a ruler should be like. He has a whole, what we call political theology, and he lays out, this is, this is the way rulers should be. And that chapter in his, his great book, The City of God, served for about a thousand years during the Middle Ages into the time of the Reformation. This is what rulers should be like. Uh, there would come a man at the end of the medieval period before the Reformation named Machiavelli who would change everything. And no, no, politicians need to be wily individuals. Uh, they can say one thing, mean another, but uh, Augustine was just a pie-in-the-sky idealist. But Augustine was not a pie-in-the-sky idealist. He was drawing from the Scriptures. If you're in a position of authority, <clears throat> should you not love justice? As I said, I hinted at yesterday, if I were uh, able to go to some of the candidate meetings, uh, you know, uh, for, say, the Progressive Conservative Party, one of the things I'd like to ask some of those candidates is, do you love justice? I mean, from your heart. Why are you wanting to be a politician? This is a rhetorical question. <clears throat> Micah knows these men don't love justice. They, they, what they want is power so they can tear the skin off <clears throat> the people of Israel, the flesh off their bones. I mean, he's using really graphic language, but anybody who knew what Assyria did, remember Assyria? <laughs> remember what they did to leaders? They flay them. Take, tear their skin off. You're just like them. You use the people of God for your own personal aggrandizement and gains. God is going to judge you, so there'll come a day of judgment, verse 4, and you'll cry out to him, and he will not listen to you. That's the first judgment oracle. The second judgment oracle begins in verse 5. So now he turns to the prophets. Micah is not the only prophet in his day. In fact, <clears throat> when you go down to uh, verse 7, no, it's actually a bit further on, sorry. When you go down into where he says, um, uh, verse, in verse, uh, verse 11, where they're, they're claiming that no harm will come upon us, uh, the implication is, well, actually, sorry, it is, yeah, uh, yeah, forgive me here, um, yeah, it is, it is in verse 7, where he, he uh, says, uh, the seers shall be disgraced, the diviners put to shame, they shall all cover their lips, there is no answer from God. It obviously implies that the, he's not, Micah's not the only prophet uh, in Israel. There are others who claim to be prophets, who claim to be teachers. And uh, in fact, Micah is a contemporary with uh, Isaiah and Hosea. And 
And uh, he's not the only one then who is making declarations from God. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace. Micah is speaking of judgment. Judgment's coming because of your sin. But these prophets say, no, no, he's wrong. <laughs> That's not what's going to happen. God is with us. Again, if you uh, notice at the end of uh, the passage, verse 11, he says, uh, its rulers give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets give oracles for money, yet they lean upon the Lord and say, surely the Lord is with us, no harm shall come upon us. Those, those, these verses are, are, are almost a graphic illustration of what was happening in Micah's ministry. Where would Micah be ministering? He'd probably be ministering in the temple in Jerusalem. He might take a stand in one of the, the outer courts and begin to preach. But there'd be others there who'd say, who would answer him back. They'd let him speak. And, no, you're wrong. This is the temple of the Lord that God has promised to be with us. You're wrong. God will not allow his temple ever to be harmed. The Lord is with us. The Lord is in our midst. There's actually here you, you get this very, I think, powerful uh, kind of illustration of this almost like a showdown between Micah and these false prophets because that's what they are. If you read through the Old Testament prophets, uh, particularly Jeremiah, you find on a number of occasions Jeremiah being confronted. Jeremiah will be preaching in the temple courts or in the heart of, the, of, his, of Jerusalem, and false prophets will be there, and they'll speak against him. Can you imagine the situation as a person of, 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 of Israel listening? Here you've got one man saying, no, no, judgment's coming. And you've got another saying, no, no, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. This is the Lord's house. The Lord is present here. He's with us in our sacrifices. The Lord has pledged to make Jerusalem his house forever. You're just wrong. You've got no idea what you're talking about. These men are in league. <laughs> Notice as he goes on in... in um, Verse 11, its rulers give judgments for money. He's indicted the rulers. You, you know, you're, you're, the only reason why you're in power is you want money and you're, 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 you're stealing from the, the middle class, taking their homes. We saw this yesterday. The priests, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll offer a, a sacrifice, but you got to pay me. And the prophets... <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll pray, but you, we'll tell you what the Lord says, but you'll feed us, right? <laughs> In other words, these false prophets, and this has been an issue that has plagued God's people from time immemorial, men who teach for money and preach for money and prophesy for money. They've, they've got power. Micah. Now we come to the heart of the verse I want to look at. But as for me, I am filled with power. It's interesting, the first verse, he, the first note he makes is, okay, you might have political power, but I have power. It's a different power. But I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and with might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So Micah, you can imagine, think of it. God's called you to speak powerfully against corruption. And you don't have any armies with you. You don't have any soldiers with you. You're by yourself, as it were. Uh, now, there would have been, as I said, these other prophets, Isaiah and Hosea, but he doesn't exactly, he doesn't mention them explicitly. There would have been others who would have sided with Micah, but obviously there's a large contingent of men who would have sided with these false prophets. 
Think of the courage it takes to stand before ruling authorities and say, you're wrong, you're sinning. Four things characterize Micah. Number one, in verse eight, power. We need power to be Christians. We need power in our daily lives to stand against the currents of our culture. Even in the best of cultures, you know, some people think, you know, oh, oh, wouldn't it have been great to have lived back in the 1950s or the 1890s? Would have been easy to be a Christian then. (laughs) Trust me, (laughs) you just have to read the, the lives of men and women. They had their own challenges. We need power to live the Christian life. We need power to share the gospel. We need power to be bold in the face of opposition. I am filled with power. I am filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And I want to flesh this out, this phrase, Spirit of the Lord, in a few minutes. I'm filled with justice. The false prophets, their main interest is money, <clears throat> filling their pockets making sure their families are doing well. They're corrupt. They're arrogant. But Micah's agenda is what is right. God's people should love what is right, what is good, what is true. Think about that verse in Philippians. You ought to think about that which is right and just and good and beautiful. Those are the sort of things that should fill our hearts and minds. Not only the big things, you know. Is it right to kill the baby in the womb? Not only those big issues. No, it's wrong. But also little issues. You know, you're in the workplace. <clears throat> and uh, there's maybe opportunity to take something home that you shouldn't take home. You know, I spend a lot of time around paper, so let me use the <laughs> illustration of paper, you know, photocopying. Well, you know, I need to do some work at home. Maybe, maybe I'll just take 20 pages. No big deal. Yes, it's a big deal. It's stealing. What we sometimes call, you know, little white lies. <laughs> no, no, they're lies. We should be men and women of truth that love what is good. In the big and in the small. And then he ends with, I'm filled with justice and might, might being a similar emphasis to power. But let me think then with you about the spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, there is an incident that takes place during the, <clears throat> the lifetime of Moses when um, Uh, God's spirit comes down and fills a variety of men who are prophesying in the the camp of Israel as God is leading Israel into the promised land. And uh, Moses is told, you know, these various people are prophesying. You need need to stop them. You're, you're, You're the prophet. And Moses says this great word, would that all God's people were prophets. The great, the great promise of the Old Testament, and we can't go into this in great, great, great detail, the great promise of the Old Testament is that the Spirit of God would indwell all believers. That He would be in each of us. The central reason, in one sense, that our Lord Jesus Christ died is that we would receive the gift of the Spirit. Without the Spirit... We can't believe. No man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. The Spirit applies to us the cleansing work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The Spirit enables us to come this morning and to delight in His Word. The Spirit opens the Scriptures. He illumines the Scriptures. The Spirit enables us to worship. No wonder C.H. Spurgeon, this might have scared some of you silly. C.H. Spurgeon, a quintessential Baptist, would sometimes stop in the middle of preaching 
and he lived, looked up to heaven, Holy Spirit, come now in power. As I said, it would scare some Baptists silly. But he's simply recognizing the truth. We cannot worship without him. And we can't live the Christian life without him. The fruit of the Spirit is his work in us. It's in us, but it's his work. We could go on and on, but I want to focus on the Spirit and courage. Think then of Micah, and I'm going to turn you in a minute to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to uh, illustrate this, this passage with an illustration from the New Testament. Think of Micah. <clears throat> Think of the courage it took to stand. Think of, let, let me, let me, let me, all of you, let's say, are the rulers of Israel and the priests and those who support you. And here is Micah. Judgment's coming because of this sin and that sin. And you're, you're, you're wincing. You're not only wincing, but you're getting angry. Because I'm calling out your sins in public. And there must have been in Micah as, 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 as a, just a human. Maybe I, won't, maybe I won't go to the temple today. <laughs> Lord, uh, you know, maybe, you know, I've already said it a few times and... No, no, you go. You go out into their midst. I, 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 we, if we had time, we could go through Jeremiah. There's two or three chapters in Jeremiah where you have Jeremiah being told to go to the town and, and stand in the temple and declare. And you could just imagine maybe the fear that might be there. But he goes because, first of all, he is concerned about justice and right and good, but he is filled with the Spirit of power. Turn then to uh, 2 Timothy, and let me illustrate this. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the key word I'm picking up here is power, the spirit of power. And also, I'm picking up the idea that every Christian, if you're a Christian, you are indwelt by the Spirit. Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you filled with the Spirit? Theologically, I'm of the persuasion you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot lose the Spirit of God once He comes to indwell you. But that doesn't mean you're walking in the power of the Spirit. It doesn't mean you're filled with the Spirit. Are you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? 2 Timothy 1, follow as I read from verse 6, and I'll read down to verse 18, the whole of the, 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 most of the chapter. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying out of my hands. For God did not give us, and I know in all of your translations, probably the spirit there is, is uh, in uh, lower case. It should be capitalized. The, the, spirit did, the Lord did not give us the spirit of cowardice, but rather the spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Now, notice as he goes on how much he talks about power. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it is now being revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I put my trust, and I'm sure he's able to guard until that day what I've entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of town sound teaching that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the gospel treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. You are aware that all who are in Asia have turned away from me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. When he arrived in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well how much service he rendered in Ephesus. Timothy, it appears, had a problem 
doing a play on words, with timidity. <laughs> the word that Paul uses there in verse, uh, verse uh, 6, uh, uh, verse 7 rather, God did not give us the spirit of cowardice. Uh, some of you might have the spirit of fear, but the word is better cowardice. It's, a, it's not the normal Greek word for fear. The normal Greek word for fear is phobos. You know, you may have a phobia, right? Arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Uh, my dear wife doesn't like things of all kinds of legs. And uh, when a spider appears in the house, uh, I have to deal with it. But it might be an agoraphobia, right? A fear of going outside or a fear of heights, acrophobia, and all kinds of phobias. Well, that's the normal Greek word, but the word that Paul uses here is delia. Delia is a very old Greek word. Paul wrote this around the year 62, 63, well, probably 64 uh, AD. Uh, delia is attested a thousand years earlier. Homer uses the word. Homer uses the word of what happens to a man in battle. I've never been in a battle. I hope to God I never am. I'm obviously at the age when I'm not going to get drafted. But I hope, I hope our sons and daughters and our grandchildren never have to engage in battles. I can't imagine being in a scenario where, even though I, you know, I like watching war movies, right? You know, Saving Private Ryan. Um, but I can't imagine being in that context. Some of you may have been in that context. Uh, in the States where I teach at Southern, it's amazing how many ex-Marines. Uh, I've been with men who have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, one or two tours, and places like Fallujah and so on. And the fear that can grip a man, paralyze him, and make him run. God has not given us that spirit. He has given us a spirit. Notice he, 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 he lands, first of all, on power. He's given us a spirit of, of, of strength and might that enables us to stand in the evil day. He goes on to fill this out, a spirit of love. And then, uh, and if we had time to kind of exegete or exposit or uh, flesh out the whole text, uh, we would take time to look at the spirit as the spirit of love and the spirit, is, uh, spirit of self-discipline. The word self-discipline there means sound-mindedness. It's a word that is hardly ever used in the New Testament. It's a word that means keeping your head. Everybody else is panicking and you keep your head. But power is the great emphasis in this chapter. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner. Paul's in prison. He's actually in a prison cell in Rome. But join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Interestingly, the, the, there's a paradox here, is there not? Suffering and power. Being filled with the spirit of power doesn't mean you don't suffer. It doesn't mean you don't experience weakness. We, we often think, okay, if there's power, there's no weakness. But the gospel means there is power in weakness. Weakness is the very place where God displays his power. Because as you notice, as Paul goes on to talk about, where is that power being most displayed? It's in Christ Jesus. And he's thinking, obviously, of the cross. Christ was crucified, 2 Corinthians 13 tells us, in weakness. But what power? The power of, 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 of the crucified Christ dealt with every one of your sins. If you're in Christ, every one of them, all the sins you know about and all the ones you don't know about, all the ones you uh, will do, but not just you, but multitudes. Uh, on uh, Monday night um, uh, when we looked at racism, I wanted to end in that passage in Revelation where it says, I saw before the throne a multitude, Revelation 7, of every language and tribe and people. It's a fabulous multicultural vision. And all of those sins of all those people, you think about them. Uh, there was a 
a great uh, theologian, he's not well known today, Samuel Hopkins, he um, was mentored by Jonathan Edwards, lived with him for about a year and a half. Um, in one of his books, he decided I, to kind of add up all the sins that people do. <laughs> I, literally, he's got this long footnote in one of his books where he says, okay, let, let's say there's so many people get saved, and he's writing this around 1780, and he's thinking about the population of the world. How many people have been saved since the beginning of time? And he's got some figure. I don't know where you come up with these figures. And let's say, you know, you did a sin every couple of minutes in thought, word, or deed. And how many sins would you commit in a lifetime of 70 years? And you got so many people, and you got all these sins. I mean, it's obviously an impossible task. But at the end of it, you realize, man, alive, all the sins, more than, more than the stars in the sky were born by our Lord. But what weakness. When, no wonder when the Jews and the Romans and the Greeks heard about the crucified Christ, they thought, there's no way. The cross is not a place of power. It's a place of shame. One thing we, you don't know from any of the fo- portraits you've ever seen of the cross is the Romans crucified men naked. They did so to shame them and humiliate them. The cross is a place of shame and weakness and death, not a place of power, but it is a place of power. As it was with our Lord, so it is with us. God displays His power in our weakness. You might be, as you, up to this point, you might be thinking, oh yeah, great, talk about the spirit, spirit of power, but man, I'm wrestling with this and I'm wrestling with that. It's in our weakness that God displays His power. Here is Paul in a Roman prison cell. He's not getting out of there. He knows that. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, he's already gone through a preliminary trial. He's, he says, I know, 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, that I've run the race. I've kept the faith. He knows that shortly, a week, a few weeks, a few months, he will be decapitated. And yet, in the midst of that weakness is the power of God. Power to bear witness to the gospel. I am not ashamed. How could he say that? Because he had the same spirit of power that filled Micah. Micah was not ashamed to stand before Israel and say, The Lord, you say the Lord is with you. No, you're involved in uh, a clear uh, incidence of sin violations of the Decalogue, violations of the commandments of God. No, the Lord is not with you, but the Lord is with those who love justice and and rightness. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then at the end of this, uh, Paul gives two, two examples. Verse 15. All who are in Asia have turned away from me, including Phygelus and Homogenes. And I think uh, Asia, Asia is Asia Minor. It's the area of Western Turkey. Uh, it's the area around the coastline of Turkey on the Aegean Sea. It would include towns like Ephesus. I think Phygelus and Mogenes, and it, it's a hard G, not a j a soft G. It's a homogenes, not homogenes. Um, these, uh, these were probably elders. These are probably leaders in the church. I think Paul, again, I'm fleshing this out a little. I think Paul's talking about his arrest when he was arrested and taken to Rome. These men didn't stand with him. Why? Because to stand with him (laughs) would have meant their arrest. But then he gives this fabulous example, and this man is one of my great heroes. He's only mentioned in the Bible twice. He's here, and then he's mentioned at the end in 2 Timothy 4, where Paul says, greet the household of Anesiphorus. Who is he? Well, he lived in Ephesus. He's got a household. (laughs) 2 Timothy, if you want to just jump over there to see the other verse, it's in 2 Timothy 19. Greet 
Prisca or Prisca and Aquila, these very close friends of Paul, and the household of Anesiphorus. So he's got a family, maybe servants. When Paul was imprisoned, this man may have purposely come to Rome to find him. Maybe he was already in Rome on a business trip. Ephesus is one end of the Mediterranean, right? It's modern, what is modern Turkey, and Rome is in Italy. So maybe he was visiting Rome for business purposes, and he hears that Paul's in prison. And notice verse 17, when he arrived in Rome, he eagerly searched for me. So as I say, maybe he came on purpose. Maybe he came and he was told, are you aware of the apostles in prison? We're not told that. But what we are told, he eagerly searched for me. Paul gives the impression that um, Paul was not easily found. This is a different, if you know the story of Paul, this is a different imprisonment than Acts 28. Acts 28, Paul is under house arrest. It's clearly known where he is. He's there for two years. This is a different imprisonment. In this imprisonment, who knows where Paul is? He's in, there is, a, there is an actual, I haven't been to Rome, but there is an actual, I've seen photographs, and people who've been there have told me, there is a, a, a prison, kind of an underground cell that is identified as the cell that Paul was in. I mean, who knows at this point in time. But what is clear is that what, he wasn't easily found. He'd have to go and ask Roman authorities. This is critical. He'd have to go and ask Roman authorities, are you holding the man called Paul? And he didn't get an, the, an answer initially. He kept searching. Notice this is dangerous. Christianity is illegal. It had become illegal in 64 AD when the Emperor Nero blamed Christians on burning the city down. From 64 AD to 312 AD, it was illegal to be a Christian. This gathering would be illegal. We couldn't gather like this. Unless we could all get into somebody's house. Anybody got a house big enough, room big enough for accommodate us all? Well, then we could gather. Otherwise, we wouldn't be gathering like this. There are no church buildings between 64 AD and 312. Please note what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we should go back to that and give up our church buildings. Until the state comes and kicks us out of our buildings, we, we keep the buildings. We stay in the public square. But there are no church buildings in this period of, of, of time. Christianity is illegal. So every time he goes to the authorities, he's putting himself at risk, right? Well, let me give you a contemporary example. Let's say you're a member of the Al-Qaeda. Horrifying, you know. And we caught, we caught one of the members of the Al-Qaeda trying to blow up uh, Queen's Park, and he's in prison. <laughs> and you go, you go to the uh, police in Toronto and say, uh, you know, is so-and-so in prison? Okay, I'd, like, you know, I'd like to see him, but well, you're, you're going to get grilled. Like, who are you? We're going to do a background check on you? Like, well, what do you want to see this guy for? He's a known terrorist. He tried to blow up the... The houses of Queen's Park. That's similar. He eagerly searched for me. And he found me. Notice Paul, he was not ashamed of my chain. He often refreshed me. He didn't just go once. <laughs> you know, he didn't just go into the prison cell where Paul is. Hey, great to see you, brother. Give him a hug. Let's pray together. Well, we'll see you later. <laughs> I'll tell the brothers and sisters where you are. We'll, we'll pray for you. He often, that little word, these little words, are, are, we can easily overlook them, but they are so important. He often refreshed me. He came back again and again and again. Every time. I've never been in a prison. I hope to God I never am. You know, I've watched movies about 
uh, people in prison. And just the, the idea of that door clanging behind you would be scary enough, right? But he goes back again and again and again. And the word Paul uses for refresh is a very fascinating word too. It's the word that is used of winds that come off the Mediterranean to clear away the humidity and smog and heat during a July or August weekend or week. Rome, Rome was a million people. Can you imagine this? A million people crammed into an area that is comparable to, if you know Toronto, between uh, Spadina and the Don Valley Parkway and Bloor Street and the Bay. A million people in there. I don't know what you think about Rome as a great city, but that, that's the size of Rome. But a million people in there living on top of each other. You think about that. Think about the hot summers, the humid summers, the stench and the smell and the humidity. But then sometimes these winds would come off the Mediterranean and blow it all away. And that's the, the Paul word that Paul uses. When, when Bible writers use various words, these other words, are they, they would have these associations in their minds. This man was like a, a, fresh of, a wind of fresh air. He came back again and again and again. He was not ashamed of my chain. You want to see what spiritual power looks like? It's not only Micah standing before the authorities and the powers that be in that temple. It's also this man, Anesiphorus. As I said, we have no idea what faces us as a province. Uh, we, we have some <laughs> very challenging issues before us, issues that deal with sexuality and gender, you know, transgenderism, and the whole area of uh, LGBTQ. I'm, my wife and I go to a chiropractor, actually, <coughs> uh, Professor Wellam's uh, brother, uh, Colin Wellam. And he's our chiropractor in Burlington. He's got, his, he's got his practice on Plains Road. And we drive back to Dundas along Plains Road, and we go back by the RBG, the Royal Botanical Gardens. Just a beautiful, beautiful display of God's creation. They've got three flags out front. They've got the flag of Canada. And for those of you who've traveled like I do, it's so good to come back and see that flag. They've got the flag of Ontario, which is a beautiful flag. And then they've got the LGBTQ, whatever, those other things added onto it. It's the, it's, it's actually not a full rainbow. It's lacking one color, but it's got the six colors. And then it's got this new one, right? The purple, pink, and uh, pink, purple, and whatever the other color is, kind of a triangular thing, which is, uh, 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 that's transgenderism. And I just think, like, what on earth did they find that for? Like, this is it's the RPG, you know, and businesses. and uh, we, we, we are going to face increasing pressure on this issue. That our culture will want us to celebrate what God regards. And I say this lovingly as sin. I have one or two friends who are celibate homosexuals. I have a very close friend. He's been a friend since my, uh, my um, uh, seminary years. And uh, he has uh, same-sex attraction. He's a professing Christian. And he has lived a celibate life. And he's fought it. And so I'm, I'm not speaking out of, you know, I don't have people I know in that. We, we have to love such. But we also have to be clear and distinct in our witness. We live in anxious times. How will we navigate such times? How will you navigate such times? 
I have, there's multitudes of experiences here, right? And different contexts, and I don't know these. But God does. And each of you are in Christ. You need the Spirit of God today to help you to live for Christ, not ashamed of the gospel and all that it teaches. If we had time, and I'm drawing to a close, we could flesh this out and how we need the Spirit of God to love. How do we love the unlovely? We need Him. But the focus here today has been on power. We need the Spirit of God as Micah did to powerfully bear witness that there is a God, a holy God, who loves sinners, who gave His Son to die for sinners, who delights in mercy, but He will judge the wicked. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for the witness of Micah 2,700 years ago now, across the centuries, may you fill us with the same spirit of power that filled him. We thank you for Onesiphorus, this little glimpse of a man of, of courage. Again, a man filled with the spirit of power. May we be men and women filled with that spirit, filled with the spirit of love, but not ashamed of the gospel. We ask in Christ's name, amen.